Welcome to another edition of the Heron Outlet. She is Alex Winley. I am Ian Heston. We miss very dearly our Austin Robillard, who will uh, join us. Uh, join join us in 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 due time. Uh, a, a little uh, um, in in, uh, in whatever uh, mood that he's in. We'll see when we get Austin. Uh, we all like it. Like every good team, always have a super sub. That comes in and out. Uh, But Alex, I wanted to get right into it because a lot of big moves that Inter-Miami has made uh, in in the coming weeks, or in the past few weeks, I should say. Let's start right at the the beginning, right at the very first one. Uh, And and we've talked about it a little, but I'm going to take us back to before all of the uh, moves that we're going to talk about moving forward. And Gene Mota uh, was really the first catalyst, if that's the right word to use, like the really first domino to fall in all of this that that was a huge overhaul in this roster. And he's now been in training the past couple of weeks, and you've gotten a chance to, to check him out. Just initial impressions on that move and, and what you think about as, as we start this 2022 discussion. Yeah, Ian, I think John Mata, he's going to have a pretty big season. You know, Chris Henderson and uh, Neville were both super high on him. Henderson said uh, multiple times he is a DP without being a DP. So, you know, the fact that he said that, I think that they're yeah, Which is a not necessarily a good thing with Inter Miami. Yeah. Yeah. Right <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, but, uh, yeah. DPs and we'll touch on Blaze later, but yeah, John Mata, I think that's he's gonna be absolutely huge. You know, uh, the past couple of seasons, Miami's only had you know either you know Blaze Matuidi or you know Will Trap, who's no longer at the club, or Victor Ijoa, who was serviceable at that spot where Blaze normally played, but you know they didn't quite get the quality they wanted, especially out of Matuidi, and that's why they're you know buying him out of his contract from what we've seen in red, um, but. Yeah, I think with Mata, you you get that playmaker from deeper in into the field without actually being a number ten. You know, he's very mobile. He's a box box uh, midfielder. You know, he can create. He can defend pretty well. He's got uh, the mobility. So, um, you know, with this new side that wants to play a bit quicker, having him like that next to Gregory will be absolutely huge. So I wanted to ask you because that style lends itself more to a 442 and we're we're going we'll, we'll get to there I guess eventually but do they need a number 10 do they need Gonzalo Higuaín to play a number 10 how tactically do you see them lining up where he's going to have to maybe drop deeper Th- that was successful last year at times but that that style of Mota and Gregory sort of as a 6-8 pivot wheel on a spoke, I guess when I look at it, I see more of like a 4-4-2. Four, four, I don't see the 4-2-3-1 that we expected Phil to, to run this year. And, and so it, it, it was a little bit confusing for me because I, he's sort of that box to box midfielder and they still need that one number 10 that's going to be the playmaker and and I I guess I was a little bit confused where where that and, and we'll get to to the other signings that they've had some of them might possibly fill that role but but I I guess I was just a bit confused as to how that fit in and if you thought that maybe a 442 would make more sense which which was like I guess a little eye-opening to me. Yeah, that's certainly possible. You know, I guess depending on the opposition, they'll they'll switch to a four, 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 two. You know, um, he's not been officially announced yet, but Leonardo Campana, uh, he's also you know a big, tall center central uh, striker. So who could maybe play alongside Iguain, stretch the defense a little bit, but uh, now that you mention it, the, the fact that there's no pure ten on this roster, it could signal them maybe shifting to a 4-3-3 we don't have any confirmation but uh, Neville did allude to wanting to use a back four but 
Looking at the personnel, there's a bunch of wingers on the side. There's Rodriguez, Robbie Robinson, Ariel Lassiter. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, just there's so many wingers on the squad. I, I think it's definitely shifting more towards a, a, a winger heavy, pretty quick play through the wings type of style of football. So um, whether or not that's a 4-2-3-1, 4 3 3 or a 4-4-2, four, four, I think that, um, you know, the more that this roster does start to round out, because did H- Henderson did also say that they're looking at players on the allocation list. Maybe they'll trade away that spot, but they are looking to add more attacking pieces. So maybe that 10 will come, maybe not. So it, it just really depends on how that roster. Uh, that That's really interesting to me, Alex. That's something that I hadn't really thought about. It, it, do you see it as, as a possible width? thing I, I from everything that i've seen of all the moves that they've made over this off season everything to me has been direct and with pace and with speed angling attacking they want to score more goals they were very unhappy with the offense last year they didn't like that they the, you know the, the, there was there's always the, the saying that when the ball's kicked off you have two decisions if you don't score then you can't then you can't win if you don't give up a goal then you can't if you don't concede then you can't lose and and they very much were a let's find a way to not concede team but i but looking at at all of those moves a 433 is very interesting especially with Iguain and the role that he sort of played last year and what he possibly could be. Walk me through it. Yeah, yeah. I think with the 4-3-3, it allows Egoin to drop deep without sacrificing numbers up top. So the two wingers would obviously go and get behind, stretch that back line. But also, I I have my little chart here. Also, as Egoin drops a bit deeper, it'll be more of a midfield four. So you got that, um, you know, those triangles in the in the middle of the park where they can have some really nice passing, uh, you know, options. Plus, if the fullbacks get up, you know, um, that also uh, increases their passing options. So, and I'm, you know, I'm just going to interrupt you real fast. You could create like a little inverted diamond there, like it, yeah, like a little much. inverted diamond four four two. I I see what you're saying. That's really interesting to think about. Yeah, and especially, you know, you get those wingers in behind, they can hold the ball, hold, hold up the ball for a couple of seconds while Iguain and those two uh, central midfielders push up, and then you'll have a line of one, two, three, like five at the front, and then the fullbacks maybe make up those two central midfielder numbers in the middle of the field, just kind of staying there at having that extra defensive protection. So it, it's a really interesting, I don't know if they'll do this, but it's a really interesting tactical um, you know, thought that they could do this, especially, like I said, Ariel Lasseter, Robbie Robinson, Rodriguez is there, you know, they've got, um, you know, Breck Shea just resigned, he can play there. So it's a really interesting tactical thing that they could uh, possibly, yeah, possibly do. I'm looking over the winger list now. Yeah, that winger, they're pretty stacked right now, I would say. Um, yeah, so with Robinson, um, side note, with Robinson, I'm really hoping he has a bounce back year, because I know last season he did well, but you know, there was still room to improve, but, you know, like I said, something playing in a formation like this could do guys like Robbie Robinson a, a pretty big, you know, it could give them some more confidence and a more ability to to showcase their, their quality, really. So let's talk about those wingers, because obviously the, the biggest headline, I would say, from this offseason was the loss of Lewis Morgan. Uh, traded to New York Red Bulls. And, of of course, you know, when you start every game in the franchise's history, that's always going to be a a big issue and and something that the fans, you know, they they, they took in stride. These are things that are going to happen. There are going to be business decisions that need to be made, especially with sanctions. But one that that I think... um, everybody is sort of handled pretty maturely and, and very, very inspirationally that, that I think like moving forward in the next era of what this club will be. Uh, So as they've focused on, like you said, Ariel Lassiter, as you said, Emerson Rodriguez uh, that that they announced that is, I, I don't, I'm not sure if he's going by Emerson Rodriguez or if he's going by Rivaldo, but we'll, we'll sort that out later. Rivaldo Uh, is the coolest name, by the way. (laughs) Rivaldo is, yeah, so cool. (laughs) 
but but you know they, uh, they they've gotten some guys that are very winger heavy, like you said. I guess I go to what Lewis was in terms of that crossing guy, in terms of that assist guy. He wasn't a goal guy, but it didn't equate to goals. It equated to opportunity. And they didn't have the finisher. And a lot of these wingers that they have now are more finishing focused and not very creating assist style focused. And so I wonder if if that was I, I don't I don't want to put anything on Lewis, but if that was like a oh, we liked this, but we didn't love it, and there you go. And and we wish you great. And now we know, oh, we need to have creators that are going to create goals, not create assists, but going to create goals. Yeah, and I think um, it was pretty telling during uh, the press conference a couple days ago. Uh, Phil Neville said, you know, the players that we have here, you know, we wanted here, which is, you know, pretty telling that they've got rid of a bunch of players and it's clear that they didn't see them fitting into where the club is going in the future. So as far as Lewis Morgan goes, um, people will say, well, he dropped back to wing back. You know, he wasn't able to, you know, be his 2020 self. But even then, um, there were games where he did start at, at, at the right or left wing and, you know, he didn't really have that end product. So I guess that's, you know, part of the reasons why Inter Miami decided to, uh, you know, you know, rightfully so, ship him off to a really good situation in the New York uh, Red Bulls, so he can play in a system where it suits his strengths. So, um, like you said, looking at the winger core here, Lasseter, Robinson, Rodriguez, they're definitely more. They're quick. Lewis Morgan was also quick, but with Rodriguez, especially, you've got a really good finishing winger. So. Um, it just shows what type of style that they're aiming for heading into 2022. They definitely want to create more and finish more chances because, you know, last year, Miami, you know, chances were few and far between. So, um, you know, this, there's, this recruitment, this off season has been, you know, quite remarkable. You know, I, I don't know the amount of players that just left. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy, but you know, as we're seeing now, we see those uh, foundational building blocks to, to, you know, get this club where they want to be really. It's an overwhelming, uh, really, uh, transformation of the club. And uh, you were at training the other day. I know that Austin and I will be at training tomorrow, but uh, it's going to be tough to recognize who who is there and who isn't there. It's it's just so overwhelming to see. We we talk about LGP's gone and Pizarro's gone, and uh, we'll get to Matuidi later. We, I, I want to talk about that. But as we're talking about the wingers, I, the, the club announced uh, earlier that uh, Emerson Rodriguez signed uh, from Colombian uh, team Milionaros, if I, I hope that I have that right, uh, 21-year-old winger, uh, very exciting player. I, re- I really like him. I, I, I got to see him a couple of times, especially in uh, uh, some Colombian youth national team games that they played against the United States. Uh, very, it goes, it goes with the, the same sort of feeling that we've had, uh, with this team that pacey diagonal, aggressively angled runner. And it, it doesn't necessarily need to be the big name. We talked about that early on with this club how they were going to sign, you know, Suarez and Messi and Ronaldo and all of these that we can like roll our eyes at all we want. But this goes to that point, but it also goes in the same function, right? That, that it, that it goes with the idea that this team wants to play quicker. This team wants to play more direct. This team wants to play more angled. This team wants to get out wide and come in on those angles that they have. And, and he really fits that mold. Does he not? Yeah. he there, And to your point, there's nothing wrong with route one football. You know, it's uh, sometimes you have to, you know, go long. It's not all about keeping possession for the sake of keeping possession. 
uh, you know, as much as we, you know, we hear about the free flowing attacking football, MLS is a league where, you know, it's beneficial to go quick and direct and over the top sometimes. So having a guy like uh, Rodriguez or Rivaldo, which I'll start calling him Rivaldo, um, you know, it's only beneficial for one. I want to see which MLS one he goes to. by I'll, because they yeah. introduced him as, as Emerson Rodriguez. They didn't introduce him as Rivaldo. So I'm, I want to see yeah, which he, one he goes by. Yeah, he could wear Rivaldo on the back of his kit, you know, it, you know, who knows, but um but yeah, having a guy like that who was an under 22 um initiative uh player, I believe the first one in Fran- uh in club history, which is absolutely huge, you know, Miami finally using those spots. Um yeah, it's it, it, it's he's an exciting player. I've done a little mini tactical uh uh thread like a, a player review on him you know he's a great crosser he know he knows how to finish and you know uh you know that's exactly the type of player Miami needs especially when you have Gonzalo up top you know just you need players that know how to create and and finish for themselves so it's it's yeah it's going to be interesting seeing you know what side he plays on too he can play on either left or right so whether if Neville wants him spamming and crosses on the right hand side or cutting in on his right on the left so it's definitely going to be interesting to see. Like you said, you guys, Austin and you, you're going to uh, um, the training tomorrow. So uh, let's, you know, we'll see what happens in regards to that. And you mentioned the under 22 initiative. I think that that's a little underscored. I, I, I think that that's very clever on Hendo's part, on Chris Henderson's part, that that the, the ability to maneuver that to make it a U22 initiative signing um, they, they, they really needed that relief in terms of the cap and what they were going to do. I think it's a very clever move, especially because I, I, I don't want to like, I guess I'm going to like birth this into the ether, but it does kind of bring the possibility of Pellegrini coming back. I don't really like know. I, I'm not like reporting anything, but, but now the, now the, the, I guess the the X's and O's, the dollars and cents, they make sense that it could be possible, especially with Carranza going to Philadelphia, that it, that it is actually plausible, I guess, in some universe. I don't know if it's likely, um, but I, I, I think that that was kind of clever for them to do. Let's move on to the one that that we all expect will be coming soon, and that's Campania that you talked about. Uh, that that uh, Thomas Rongen did a, a wonderful job of accidentally spilling the beans on that <laughs> the other day. I love that man. He was a great coach. Yeah, they have to say allegedly real quick. <laughs> <Allegedly>. <laughs> that was very funny. I enjoyed that. Um, but but he, I, I really like the the ability to play with this. It, it, it's almost like. Um, like a buffet when you add him that you can play with two at the top or you could have PP to drop or you can have Campania drop or you could play one as a super sub and the other start. And then the next game one starts and the other is a super sub there. there it, it's almost like a, like a, uh, an interesting buffet that they can play around with until they figure out what works. Yeah, and I was just looking up uh, Campania right now. He, it, it's a shame he's not really panned out at any club. You know, Wolves brought him over from a at, on a free from I believe Ecuador, and then he got loaned out twice, and he's just not really put it together. But he's super highly rated, and and you see why. You look at his skills. He's you know the six three striker, but he's very mobile and he's very quick. You know, obviously he's strong. He's good technically. I believe he's left footed as well, so that would be a good you know companion to almost you know, exclusively left footed. He's almost yeah, exclusively that's, that's, left-footed, yeah. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing. I, left-footed players, they seem to bring a different, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, their brain wiring. I don't know, but they seem to bring a different, you know, feel to the game of soccer. I don't know. I feel like, you know, especially left-sided, uh, in, you know, side note, especially left-sided midfielders, I feel like they just bring something different, but I don't know. It's just me talking, but yeah, Campana, I'm I'm super high on him. I think he has all these tools to be successful in MLS. You know, like I said, he's big, strong, technically gifted. He can play with his back to goal. He can get in behind. And, you know, whenever they do announce him, I think he'll be, 
a, a real good either starter or coming off the bench. I think he'll definitely be a, I don't, we don't know the contract details, but he'll, he'll definitely probably be cheaper than uh, what Carranza was uh, on. But, but uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm super high on him and I'm excited to see him, you know, play for Miami, whether he starts or comes off the bench, he will definitely get some, some starts, you know, the club wants to get younger and, you know, Gonzalo can't play in every game and plus the U S open cup that is returning. So definitely there's going to be some, uh, rotational minutes that uh, he'll be able to get. So um, yeah, I'm super high on him, and I'm 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 curious to see how tactically he fits into the squad. Let's not forget that Inter Miami was one game away from making the well, it didn't wind up happening, but like that qualification for the U.S. Open Cup last year. So they 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 were right there. Um, yeah. and it for, for a couple of bounces probably would have been in the U S open cup. The, the, the thing that I am curious about with him is, you know, we talk about Mitch Curry that, that announced on Instagram earlier that he's not going to basically, he didn't say it directly, but all, but did announce that he's not returning to the club. He thanked Miami for everything and, and for his time with Fort Lauderdale CF. Uh, you, you have certain guys that are coming in. Um, you have an Ascona, you have an Acosta, you have all of these. We, we, we talked about the wingers. You have these sort of attacking minded, youthful players. Where do you put like the pecking order as it stands right now? Or is this all kind of Iguain one and then everybody else is fighting for that second spot and we're just going to play it out during preseason training. I think it'll be the best man up for the job. I don't think there's anything full bar for goalkeeper maybe, but you know, Nick Marsman still recovering from an injury. I think, you know, whatever player wants it, wants it more will start. I don't think there anyone is set in stone really. Um, but they have so they have so much turnover that that like the names yeah. that are going to be on the field are so different than what we dealt with just a couple of months ago. That it sort of feels like there must be a hierarchy in order to make yeah. this work. But but it, but you know we'll, we'll get to it in a sec. But Breck Shea just got re-signed and. And there's some guys that were in the building in October and November, but they're almost like the, 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 the rarity. They're almost like the new kids on the block because there's so many turnovers and, and so much new faces that'll be in that building right now in, in these first couple of days in this first week that, that it, almost feels like anything's up for grabs. Yeah, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, sometimes you need fresh faces to, you know, get the blood going, I guess. And, you know, like I said earlier, Neville said every player that is here, they wanted here. So it, it, I think, you know, especially like you said, Breck Shea resigning, I, I think there will be a, a slight hierarchy. Of course, the older players, you know, Gibbs, um, Ujoa, uh, Breck Shea, you know, Gregory, even John Mata, who is new, but he's also a little bit older. He's 28, 27, 28. So that, that, that leadership role will definitely fall on those older players. But at the same time, obviously MLS is a league where, you know, if you're a young player and you're good enough, you will thrive. So, um, I, I don't think necessarily it'll be like, a, oh, older players will start first. It'll be more so the best player up. You know, if that means, um, uh, I don't know, Bryce Duke starts one game, then so be it. If that means, you know, um, Clement Diop has to, start, has to start in goal one day, so be it. You know, it, it's just next man up. You know, MLS is a league where you do need depth and physicality in order to win games, so... Um, yeah, I fully expect um, there to be a lot of rotation because Inter Miami struggled with injuries last season, and I think the squad is built in a way where, you know, um, it's younger, but it's also have it also has good depth, and um, you know, there's enough older players to you know see that leadership roll out too. And you can catch that press conference that Phil had, uh, Chris Henderson had, Gonzalo Iguain had with Alex. Uh, on uh, on assignment for us at the Heron Outlet and at our YouTube page for us. Alex, let, let's move forward 
with uh, Breck Shea's re-signing because I found that not surprising, but what a story this is. Because let's not forget, a couple of years ago, he was signed to Fort Lauderdale, rose up the ranks, became a fan favorite, uh, got some starts, and then the club dec- declined his, his contract. And to bring him back now, you know, he, he was a, a sort of like a role model role for a couple of guys. He was a, a, a sort of like an embattled for minutes guy for a while. What role does he serve in 2022 on Inter Miami? No uh, experienced MLS veteran. I think there's a lot of, not only is there a lot of uh, um, younger players coming in, there's a lot of players who've never played in MLS uh, before coming in, like McVay, you know, Campana. Allegedly, they still got to announce this, him signing. But, we didn't uh, even Rodriguez. talk about Christopher McVay. Yeah, I think McVay is going to be one of those very understated players that gets on with his job and does super well, but and no one has any complaints because he's just a steady Eddie and we can touch on him later, but um, yeah, guys like McVay, uh, Campana, Rodriguez, there's tons of, uh, and even still, there's some, maybe some players that are, will be coming in. There's players that have not played in MLS before, Jean Mata. Uh, so I think with guys, a guy like Breck Shea, and even Victor Ijo to an extent, having guys with MLS experience and who have played in Inter Miami and know the club and know what Phil Neville wants in a locker room, having guys like Breck Shea and Victor Ijo, it's... Uh, you know, imperative to be in a, a successful MLS club. You know, we can't just, you know, you, you know, as a club, you can't just, you know, throw players in there that haven't necessarily played in the league and expect them to do well. There's travel. There's all these other things. So, um, yeah, um, Breck Shea, he's a fan favorite. So um, he's definitely going to get some minutes and some rotational uh, uh, minutes as well and maybe even start, you know, Kieran Gibbs did have, um, some injury issues last season, and Breck slid into the left back and did quite well. So, re-signing him was a... You, yeah, you mentioned Uoa. You mentioned Uoa, yeah. who played right back a couple of games last year. Breck yeah. played left back a couple of games last year. Would you play either of them in those positions anymore, or they should specifically be, for Uoa, a center midfielder, and for Breck, a left mid, left winger? Mm, I think Breck yeah yeah I think Breck uh playing him as a left back for a couple games isn't bad you know you know he's serviceable there you know there were a couple games last season where he did you know pretty good job I I I don't know if it was the Cincinnati last minute winner game where Figal had that great diagonal cross and uh, Shea I don't know if he was playing as a wing back or left back he was able to get on the end of that so Shea is definitely a a serviceable player for as far as Victor Ijoa goes I would not play him as right back I I know he can play there but um Miami's roster is not finished and right now the only natural left back I mean excuse me uh right full back on the roster is McVeigh. I know um Mo Adams can play we didn't even touch on Mo Adams that's that's how you know how many incoming players that uh, has in. There's so well, yeah. many guys. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, but Mo Adams can also play as a right back, and I'll touch on Mo Adams a little bit. He's a center midfielder, defensive midfielder, guys. But he's built, basically built like Uoa. Yeah, I, I would think he has a bit of a you know better engine and more physical than usual a little bit, and you know he was highly rated coming out of Atlanta and that trade. Uh, I believe it was a trade, or we traded for his rights. Uh, Miami traded for his rights for Castanier, but yeah, he's a serviceable player who will get some starts and you know he, he's a he's a tough cookie so I'm looking forward to see him seeing him play but yeah I would you know I would start Mo Adams at right back over uh Ujoa. um you know Ujoa can't play there but you know he doesn't look the most comfortable and obviously he's better as a the um a central midfielder so right so <laughs> let, let's go there because we've sort of moved our way back Right. So we started up top. We're, we're moving our way back. And we talked about Christopher McVeigh, who's coming uh, from overseas, from Europe, and uh, ha- had sort of like a, I don't want to call it like a roller coaster, but had, had its ups and had its downs in his career as, as he had in going through like the youth academy in Sweden and everything that he went through. Uh, and, and trying to make it as a professional, definitely a hardworking guy. 
definitely a very tall right back if that's where he winds out. Uh, I think he's six foot three. So for him to uh, be be that as a right back is is a little just like whoa. Um, do you see him there? Do you see him more as like a Fagal who uh, was was you know center right center right whatever we need you to be sort of type? Um, or, or, or where do you see him sort of? I, I think that he's a first teamer. I think that he's like an every single day guy. I think that that's going to wind up being what he's going to be. But I wonder where that's sort of what I'm trying to figure out and what I'm sort of trying to see. I think as of right now, there is no natural fullback on the roster. So McVeigh day one is the starter and it's, you rarely see fullbacks that tall like he's 6'3 and ev- honestly every you know player that you, like Inter is getting a lot of tall players like Mabika signed and we'll touch on uh, May Mabika and Georgia Costa signing too uh, Mabika signed McVeigh he's 6'3 Mabika he's 6'6 six, Kinteros six. is you know six foot there's a you know a lot of tall players on this roster so and even Robbie Robinson I believe he's what 6'2 so you know it it it's funny because Miami struggled with set pieces so bad, and now they've they've got a flurry of tall it's players. Like they just have like <laughs> a bunch of yeah giants, and 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 the weirdest part about it is that they want to play faster, and they just have these like, yeah these these tall trees all over the place. Yeah, but I think the cool thing is, um, seeing a couple clips of McVeigh that the team put out. You know he's quite he's quite quick for a, a guy who's what six three. So I don't think he'll you know I don't think he'll be like a pace burner. But he's quite quick and you know as a defender you always need that quick first step. Obviously you don't need to be you know rapid, but you need that quick burst of acceleration to get you know um you know to get on your attacker to you know defend properly. But yeah, it, it's crazy. Yeah, you're right. They do want to play quicker, but I don't think these are guys that are you know necessarily slow. You know, we'll take LGP, for example. He was, what, about six foot. But, you know, he was not the quickest, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, center back. But, you know, looking at Quinteros and even Mabika, they all have really quick first steps. So, um, yeah. And, and of course, you know, Neville will tailor the tactics to, um, you know, the squad he has available. So, um, but, yeah, McVeigh, I'm, I'm super excited to see him. I think he'll bring a different dynamic to that right back spot. You know, looking at Leardom and Morgan back uh, – um, last season and Figal, um, you know, they all brought different things, but I think McVeigh, Miami has a, that a proper whole, that that whole right side never never yeah, clicked. Yeah. It it just even from it, the first it, season. It, it, yeah. Right. If it wasn't Lewis at right back and it wasn't Vasilev at right winger, they there was no connection there. And it just never seemed to click. It it really didn't. And I, I mean, I hope that it's different. It's definitely going to be a di- very different playing style this year. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, and, sure. yeah. And I think with uh, Rodriguez, you know, like, you know, Ariel Lasseter can play on that right side. He's left footed. I believe he can cut inside Rodriguez. He's right footed, you know, even Robbie can play there. So, and I think they'll probably end up bringing in more attacking wingers as well, but yeah, that right side has never been really steady, and I think with McVeigh signing and you know Rodriguez, we've got a potential a winger and and fullback uh, combination that we haven't seen for you know for well the entire entirety of Inter Miami's existence. So, um, yeah, I'm 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 curious to see how that's going to pan out. I know Miami has a couple; they have a couple of preseason games coming up. Uh, one of which I will be going to, um, I believe, on the 29th against, I, I think it's DC, but, and, you know, we'll, we'll see how, um, you know, they fare in that in that scrimmage. But, yeah, it's, ex- it's interesting and, and exciting tactically. I wanted to talk to you about more about the defense, and, and specifically Damian Lowe. Uh, coming over uh, the Jamaican national team, he, he I think he captained a couple of games for them. Um, and a, another big, tall defender that Inter Miami is bringing in, but a guy that has primarily played, at least in the United States. I mean, he was he, he's coming over from Egypt, was it, where he was playing, but in the United States, primarily played in the USL. He didn't primarily play in MLS. 
And at a time in his career where this is sort of like a make or break time, does do you see him fitting in right away as a first team starter? Or is this going to be a merit-based situation with all of the defenders, I guess? Yeah, I think it's definitely merit-based. I will say uh, Damian Lowe is too good to be playing in Egypt. No offense to the Egyptian league, but looking at his tape, he's very... I'm surprised another MLS team hasn't picked him up yet. You know, looking at the reactions to Miami signing him, it's everyone saying, "Oh, you've got a good, you've got a good guy, you've got a good player." Um, you know, uh, all the Jamaicans who watch their national team religiously, um, they're constantly stating how good Damien is. So, um, I'm also excited to see him uh, uh, get on with the team. I know he's in. Uh, I think they're playing the Jamaican national team. They're playing Peru. Uh, tomorrow so he won't be in camp for a while because there's also I believe World Cup qualifying I've got to double check but um, yeah I'm, I'm super excited for him and I think going back to your your point about um, it being merit-based I absolutely think it is because listening to Ryan Saylor Inter Miami's uh, ninth overall draft pick uh, you know listening to him he was pretty hell-bent on saying yeah I'm coming here to try to win the starting job and that's natural when Inter Miami got rid of LGP and Figal and McCoon which it hurts, but I, I see why they did that. You know, there it's the center back job is definitely up for grabs. I know the team is pretty high on Quintero. So, um, yeah, it's definitely going to be a fight. And, it, you know, that's a good thing. Having competition in places, that only makes the, the team better. So, um, yeah, it's definitely going to be an intriguing battle. But, um, you know, the, the best player will ultimately uh, get that starting job day one. Let's talk about the McCoon deal because we haven't gotten a chance, I think, on the pod to talk about it yet because you and I have had a fun back and forth about this that we think that there are, uh, we, we differ in opinion on what we think the plan is on that. Um, you, you want them to go for it. You want them to find a player on that list because I think that it's bait. I, I, I completely think that it's bait. I think that there are, at least two teams that really want that number one allocation. And I think, in my opinion, I'll just state it here, I think that it is a great piece of meat dangling in front of a couple of MLS teams. I'm not going to state them because I don't want to hurt the team. But I I think that there are a couple of teams that would not mind paying a pretty penny for that number one allocation spot and I don't think that Inter Miami needs it yeah I will say um yeah there's the allocation spot I think it's definitely valuable um I I read um that uh, like you said not to mention teams but there was a report where Orlando City was apparently trying to get Yedlin from Galatasaray and obviously there was that Tom Bogart from MLSsoccer.com's report about you know, Orlando potentially make a move for that spot, which would be funny because Miami and Orlando are rivals, so Miami could basically just hold <laughs> a, a ransom just over there. Just go ahead and say it, Alex. <laughs> yeah, <this> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they could hold a, a, a ransom over uh, their head in regards to that spot. But I will say uh, during, uh, I believe it was the preseason coverage, uh, Chris Anderson said, yeah, that is a thing that they're potentially looking to bring in another attacking player for. Like I said, they could either trade it off or use that. But um, yeah, they could trade it off for more, you know, either a player or more allocation money. A more allocation money would make sense. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm curious to see what they do with that. I don't have any insert info or reporting to do about that. But um, whatever it is, it's going to be um, used to uh, bring in another pay- player, basically. But are you upset that it cost McCoon for it? I mean, like that, that kind of hurt. I, I, w- I really was, uh, I, I didn't think that, I, I saw him as a, as a future centerpiece. I didn't see him as a number one allocation spot guy. I mean, yes, don't, don't get me wrong. If you know MLS rules, that is a very valuable asset to have. But I just felt like McCoon was starting to be in the mix and really starting to hit his stride as a guy that we wanted here in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, et cetera. Yeah, the McCoon trade was, well, initially it was confusing because at the time it was, there were reports of LGP and Figal leaving. Now we know that, you know, Figal is uh, allegedly on his way out. LGP has, has left. Um... 
Yeah, it, it was a little bit confusing, but as I started to dig deeper, I can understand why they did it. The allocation spot is very valuable. You know, um, McCoon, well, yes, he's an up-and-coming center back. You know, his strengths did lie in that back three. And if Inter Miami switching to a flat back four, there were times where McCoon, you know, that was his weakness, is playing in a back four where there wasn't another body there to cover him. So if they didn't see him as that long term option there, they might as well, you know, you know, yeah, but I don't here, want to but say cut their losses, thing. but yeah. here's my thing, right? Like we we got we we dealt with Andres Reyes last year <laughs> completely showing up that that he could be what we all hoped that he would in Miami, he wound up being actually a decent MLS player. And he mm-hmm. wasn't that in Miami. He was that in New York. And and so you get, uh, I, I guess, like a little bit concerned that Christian McCoon, right as he's starting to be a somewhat decent player, that you're sending him to Charlotte and and now all of a sudden you're going to deal with that again. I, I will repeat this. The number one allocation spot is a tremendous asset in Major League Soccer. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And I am sure whether it is through player personnel or through trading that Inter Miami will receive top dollar on, on that. I just, you you always wonder if you're chasing the yellow brick road and you're never going to end up at Oz. And and that that that's always, I guess, sort of the fear with all of it um, that, that, that I get concerned with. As we talk about assets and what this team is going to be able to do, especially with the sanctions, especially as they start the first year of the sanctions, especially as they start all of this, we cannot escape the uh, saga that is Blaise Matui. So how do we want to address this? What is he going to do? Where are we going to go? You, I, the floor is yours because you've been at the forefront of this. So I'll just let you sort of rant if you want. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. The Matuidi thing. I think initially when he did come to Miami, obviously he was a bit of an upgrade over what the team had at that point. But yeah, it was it, Uoa, just, by the way. It was you. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes players just don't play well together. And Will Trap and Usual are good individual players, but maybe they just you know their styles conflicted a little bit in what Diego Alonso wanted to do. But Matuidi, um, yeah, even. You know, initially buying him, uh, acquiring him, uh, Juventus, yeah, he was regressing there. So bringing him over to MLS, it didn't really make sense. You know, yeah, yeah, players that, you know, made their career off of, you know, physicality and energy, you know, as they age, obviously that starts to go with it. So, you know, it was just a bizarre signing from the beginning and the fact that Miami skirted the rules to sign him. It just makes it even look even worse. Uh, yeah, it, you know, it, it's his time to go, you know, even last season, we saw him, you know, get progressively worse and maybe not put in as much effort as he should have. And as he it, played his, time, la- as, he, his time. as he played his last game in an Inter Miami uniform. Oh, yeah. You you look on his social media. He's not even in my I don't even think he's in Miami. He's training away from the facilities and even, you know, you know, the team reported to a training camp this Monday. So, you know, the fact that he's not there training, it's a pretty big indication. And even per the Miami Herald, uh, you know, Michelle Kaufman, she has reported that, you know, that he's not, Matuidi's not in Inter Miami's plans at all. So, um, yeah, maybe uh, I will say, I forgot to mention, during that press conference, Chris Henderson said, um, that in the next, well, not next couple of days, but he said soon that they will have a, a, a an announcement, a, a little memo about um, a Tweety, you know, maybe he'll get bought out, maybe he'll move to another club. We don't know, but <laughs> yeah, it, he's gone. He's gone. I, you know, I'm sighing because I've ranted and talked about him on this pod and wrote about it for, you know, I, so I many times. It's it just, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, I just think that it's, it's so, it's such like a, I don't even know if it's a shame. It's it's so disappointing. It was a blatantly bad, blatantly bad move yeah, from the beginning. Just, it, it, yeah, 
low yeah. soccer IQ move, basically. Like, no one building an MLS squad would say, yes, buy a 33-year-old Blaise Matuidi as one of your building blocks. Like, that That doesn't make sense. But, you know, Miami, they're and, starting and, to right their wrongs. And, so. and for it to bring about all of the it, sanctions that the, they have, yeah. it's like a double whammy when, when, when it comes to that. It, it, it's just so frustrating. Let's focus yeah. on how the team is going to move forward, though. With 2022, the, the, the schedule is out. The team is back together. You were there the first training session. Austin and I will be there tomorrow. Like, what were your first impressions? How, like, is this something to be excited about? Tell me expectations. Tell me what we want to talk about. Tell me where we're going to go. And and let's see as we grow incrementally forward towards February 26, when this team is going to kick off to start their season, uh, you know, because this is the earliest start in MLS history. And this is going to end before the World Cup starts in Qatar in 2022 at the end of the year. Uh, that that, that it, it, is this a team that, that, Right off the bat, we can go and say, oh, my God, there's so many new names and we might not know them, but there's speed, there's size and there's talent. Yeah, I think, um, you know, that preseason, um, that first uh, day of training, it, it felt there was like a, a real buzz, like it felt you know, exciting, you know, looking at, you know, even the live stream, it, it felt very you know, like you felt the buzz in the air. And I think, you know, it's just, it's like an expansion season all over again, really. I think, yeah, you know, Chris Anderson called it a, a real. I feel like we've had three of these already, Alex. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it feels like a, a, another, a, a, another expansion season. I think, you know, it, it's a rebuild. It, you know, there's a lot of excitement going around. I think, these Suarez rumors, yeah, I, I think these younger players, you know, they they should be giving a shot, really. You know, you look at um, NYCFC who won MLS Cup; they didn't have global superstars on their on their squad winning. They had, you know, guys like Tati but Castellanos. They had Castellanos yeah, them. exactly. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, he's not a global star yet, but you know, he's a good young player that carried, you know, you know, carried them to MLS Cup, and that's what. You know, Miami fans need to understand that it's not going to be a Suarez that shoots them into the, you know, playoffs. It's going to be guys like, you know, Rodriguez, Campana, Bryce Duke, young, hungry players that are quicker and, uh, you know, tactically flexible and adaptable that are going to help Miami. So um, as training camp continues, obviously they'll add more players. But, yeah, it, it, it feels different. It feels different. And I think, obviously, there's a lot of new players that so will take time, but um, yeah, you just got to let this team gel. And I think that they will definitely improve from what they did last season. Well, we will have preseason coverage throughout up until the first game coming up February 26th. Uh, Inter Miami will open up their season. Austin Robillard, we miss you, buddy. And for Alex Winley, I am Ian Heston. For producer Andres, this is the Heron Outlet. Make sure you... Follow us on Instagram, on YouTube, on Twitter, at The Heron Outlet. And we will see you back here this time next week.